Chapter Seventeen, Part One of The Voyage Out by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was now the height of the season, and every ship that came from England left a few people on the shores of Santa Marina, who drove up to the hotel. The fact that the Ambroses had a house where one could escape momentarily from the slightly inhuman atmosphere of an hotel was a source of genuine pleasure, not only to Hurst and Hewitt, but to the Elliots, the Thornburys, the Flushings, Miss Allen, Evelyn M., together with other people whose identity was so little developed that the Ambroses did not discover that they possessed names. By degrees there was established a kind of correspondence between the two houses, the big and the small, so that at most hours of the day one house could guess what was going on in the other, and the words the villa and the hotel called up the idea of two separate systems of life. Acquaintances showed signs of developing into friends, for that one tie to Mrs. Parry's drawing-room had inevitably split into many other ties attached to different parts of England, and sometimes these alliances seemed cynically fragile, and sometimes painfully acute, lacking as they did the supporting background of organized English life. One night, when the moon was round between the trees, Evelyn M. told Helen the story of her life and claimed her everlasting friendship. On another occasion, merely because of a sigh, or a pause, or a word thoughtlessly dropped, poor Mrs. Elliot left the villa half in tears, vowing never again to meet the cold and scornful woman who had insulted her, and in truth, meet again they never did. It did not seem worth while to piece together so slight a friendship. Hewitt, indeed, might have found excellent material at this time up at the villa for some chapters in the novel which was to be called Silence, or The Things People Don't Say. Helen and Rachel had become very silent. Having detected, as she thought, a secret, and judging that Rachel meant to keep it from her. Mrs. Ambrose respected it carefully, but from that cause, though unintentionally, a curious atmosphere of reserve grew up between them. Instead of sharing their views upon all subjects and plunging after an idea wherever it might lead, they spoke chiefly in comment upon the people they saw, and the secret between them made itself felt in what they said even of Thornburys and Elliots. Always calm and unemotional in her judgments, Mrs. Ambrose was now inclined to be definitely pessimistic. She was not severe upon individuals so much as incredulous of the kindness of destiny, fate, what happens in the long run and apt to insist that this was generally adverse to people in proportion as they deserved well. Even this theory she was ready to discard in favour of one which made chaos triumphant, things happening for no reason at all, and everyone groping about in illusion and ignorance. With a certain pleasure she developed these views to her niece, taking a letter from home as her test, which gave good news, but might just as well have given bad. How did she know that at this very moment both her children were not lying dead, crushed by motor omnibuses? It's happening to somebody. Why shouldn't it happen to me? she would argue, her face taking on the stoical expression of anticipated sorrow. However sincere these views may have been, they were undoubtedly called forth by the irrational state of her niece's mind. It was so fluctuating, and went so quickly from joy to despair, 
that it seemed necessary to confront it with some stable opinion, which naturally became dark as well as stable. Perhaps Mrs. Ambrose had some idea that in leading the talk into these quarters she might discover what was in Rachel's mind, but it was difficult to judge, for sometimes she would agree with the gloomiest thing that was said, at other times she refused to listen, and rammed Helen's theories down her throat with laughter, chatter, ridicule of the wildest and fierce bursts of anger, even at what she called the croaking of a raven in the mud. It's hard enough without that, she asserted. What's hard? Helen demanded. Life, she replied, and then they both became silent. Helen might draw her own conclusions as to why life was hard, as to why an hour later perhaps life was something so wonderful and vivid, that the eyes of Rachel beholding it were positively exhilarating to a spectator. True to her creed she did not attempt to interfere, although there were enough of those weak moments of depression to make it perfectly easy for a less scrupulous person to press through and know all, and perhaps Rachel was sorry that she did not choose. All these moods ran themselves into one general effect, which Helen compared to the sliding of a river. Quick, quicker, quicker still, as it races to a waterfall. Her instinct was to cry out, stop, but even had there been any use in crying stop, she would have refrained, thinking it best that things should take their way, the water racing because the earth was shaped to make it race. It seemed that Rachel herself had no suspicion that she was watched, or that there was anything in her manner likely to draw attention to her. What had happened to her she did not know. Her mind was very much in the condition of the racing water to which Helen compared it. She wanted to see Terence. She was perpetually wishing to see him when he was not there. It was an agony to miss seeing him. Agonies were strewn all about her day on account of him. But she never asked herself what this force driving through her life arose from. She thought of no result any more than a tree perpetually pressed downwards by the wind considers the result of being pressed downwards by the wind. During the two or three weeks which had passed since their walk, half a dozen notes from him had accumulated in her drawer. She would read them and spend the whole morning in a daze of happiness the sunny land outside the window being no less capable of analyzing its own color and heat than she was of analyzing hers. In these moods she found it impossible to read or play the piano, even to move being beyond her inclination. The time passed without her noticing it. When it was dark she was drawn to the window by the lights of the hotel. A light that went in and out was the light in Terence's window. There he sat, reading perhaps, or now he was walking up and down, pulling out one book after another, and now he was seated in his chair again, and she tried to imagine what he was thinking about. The steady lights marked the rooms where Terence sat with people moving around him. Every one who stayed in the hotel had a peculiar romance and interest about them. They were not ordinary people. She would attribute wisdom to Mrs. Elliot, beauty to Susan Warrington, a splendid vitality to Evelyn M., because Terence spoke to them. As unreflecting and pervasive were the moods of depression, her mind was as the landscape outside when dark beneath clouds and straightly lashed by wind and hail, 
again she would sit passive in her chair exposed to pain and helen's fantastical or gloomy words were like so many darts goading her to cry out against the hardness of life best of all were the moods when for no reason again this stress of feeling slackened and life went on as usual only with a joy and colour in its events that was unknown before they had a significance like that which she had seen in the tree the nights were black bars separating her from the days she would have liked to run all the days into one long continuity of sensation although these moods were directly or indirectly caused by the presence of terence or the thought of him she never said to herself that she was in love with him or considered what was to happen if she continued to feel such things so that helen's image of the river sliding on to the waterfall had a great likeness to the facts and the alarm which helen sometimes felt was justified in her curious condition of unanalyzed sensations she was incapable of making a plan which should have any effect upon her state of mind she abandoned herself to the mercy of accidents missing terence one day meeting him the next receiving his letters always with a start of surprise any woman experienced in the progress of courtship would have come by certain opinions from all this which would have given her at least a theory to go upon but no one had ever been in love with rachel and she had never been in love with any one moreover none of the books she read from wuthering heights to man and superman and the plays of ibsen suggested from their analysis of love that what their heroines felt was what she was feeling now it seemed to her that her sensations had no name she met terence frequently when they did not meet he was apt to send a note with a book or about a book for he had not been able after all to neglect that approach to intimacy but sometimes he did not come or did not write for several days at a time again when they met their meeting might be one of inspiriting joy or of harassing despair over all their partings hung the sense of interruption leaving them both unsatisfied though ignorant that the other shared the feeling if rachel was ignorant of her own feelings she was even more completely ignorant of his at first he moved as a god as she came to know him better he was still the centre of light but combined with this beauty a wonderful power of making her daring and confident of herself she was conscious of emotions and powers which she had never suspected in herself and of a depth in the world hitherto unknown when she thought of their relationship she saw rather than reasoned representing her view of what terence felt by a picture of him drawn across the room to stand by her side this passage across the room amounted to a physical sensation but what it meant she did not know thus the time went on wearing a calm bright look upon its surface letters came from england letters came from willoughby and the days accumulated their small events which shaped the year superficially three odes of pindar were mended helen covered about five inches of her embroidery and st john completed the first two acts of a play he and rachel being now very good friends he read them aloud to her and she was so genuinely impressed by the skill of his rhythms and the variety of his adjectives as well as by the fact that he was terence's friend that he began to wonder whether he was not intended for literature rather than for law 
It was a time of profound thought and sudden revelations for more than one couple, and several single people. A Sunday came, which no one in the villa, with the exception of Rachel and the Spanish maid, proposed to recognise. Rachel still went to church, because she had never, according to Helen, taken the trouble to think about it. Since they had celebrated the service at the hotel, she went there expecting to get some pleasure from her passage across the garden and through the hall of the hotel, although it was very doubtful whether she would see Terence, or at any rate have the chance of speaking to him. As the greater number of visitors at the hotel were English, there was almost as much difference between Sunday and Wednesday as there is in England, and Sunday appeared here as there, the mute black ghost or penitent spirit of the busy weekday. The English could not pale the sunshine, but they could in some miraculous way slow down the hours, dull the incidents, lengthen the meals, and make even the servants and page-boys wear a look of boredom and propriety. The best clothes which every one put on helped the general effect. It seemed that no lady could sit down without bending a clean starched petticoat, and no gentleman could breathe without a sudden crackle from a stiff shirt front. As the hands of the clock neared eleven on this particular Sunday, various people tended to draw together in the hall clasping little red-leaved books in their hands. The clock marked a few minutes to the hour when a stout black figure passed through the hall with a preoccupied expression, as though he would rather not recognize salutations, although aware of them, and disappeared down the corridor which led from it. Mr. Bax, Mrs. Thornbury whispered, a little group of people then began to move off in the same direction as the stout black figure, looked at in an odd way by people who made no effort to join them. They moved with one exception, slowly and consciously, towards the stairs. Mrs. Flushing was the exception. She came running downstairs, strode across the hall, joined the procession, much out of breath demanding of Mrs. Thornbury, in an agitated whisper, Where? Where? We are all going, said Mrs. Thornbury gently, and soon they were descending the stairs two by two. Rachel was among the first to descend. She did not see that Terence and Hurst came in at the rear, possessed of no black volume but of one thin book bound in light blue cloth, which St. John carried under his arm. The chapel was the old chapel of the monks. It was a profound, cool place where they had said mass for hundreds of years, and done penance in the cold moonlight, and worshipped old brown pictures and carved saints which stood with upraised hands of blessing in the hollows in the walls. The transition from Catholic to Protestant worship had been bridged by a time of disuse, when there were no services, and the place was used for storing jars of oil, liqueur, and deck chairs. The hotel flourishing, some religious body had taken the place in hand and it was now fitted out with a number of glazed yellow benches, claret-coloured footstools. It had a small pulpit, and a brass eagle carrying the Bible on its back, while the piety of different women had supplied ugly squares of carpet, and long strips of embroidery heavily wrought with monograms in gold. As the congregation entered, they were met by mild, sweet chords issuing from a harmonium, where Miss Willet, concealed from view by a baize curtain, 
struck emphatic chords with uncertain fingers. The sound spread through the chapel as the rings of water spread from a fallen stone. The twenty or twenty-five people who composed the congregation first bowed their heads and then sat up and looked about them. It was very quiet, and the light down here seemed paler than the light above. The usual bows and smiles were dispensed with, but they recognized each other. The Lord's Prayer was read over them. As the childlike babble of voices rose, the congregation, many of whom had only met on the staircase, felt themselves pathetically united and well disposed towards each other. As if the prayer were a torch applied to fuel, a smoke seemed to rise automatically and fill the place with the ghosts of innumerable services on innumerable Sunday mornings at home. Susan Warrington in particular was conscious of the sweetest sense of sisterhood as she covered her face with her hands and saw slips of bent backs through the chinks between her fingers. Her emotions rose calmly and evenly, approving of herself and of life at the same time. It was all so quiet and so good. But having created this peaceful atmosphere, Mr. Bax suddenly turned the page and read a psalm. Though he read it with no change of voice, the mood was broken. Be merciful unto me, O God, he read, for man goeth about to devour me. He is daily fighting and troubling me. They daily mistake my words. All that they imagine is to do me evil. They hold all together and keep themselves close. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouths. Smite the jawbones of the lions, O Lord. Let them fall away like water that runneth apace. And when they shoot their arrows, let them be rooted out. Nothing in Susan's experience at all corresponded with this. And as she had no love of language, she had long ceased to attend to such remarks although she followed them with the same kind of mechanical respect with which she heard many of Lear's speeches read aloud. Her mind was still serene and really occupied with praise of her own nature and praise of God, that is, of the solemn and satisfactory order of the world. But it could be seen from a glance at their faces that most of the others the men in particular, felt the inconvenience of the sudden intrusion of this old savage. They looked more secular and critical as they listened to the ravings of the old black man with a cloth round his loins, cursing with vehement gesture by a campfire in the desert. After that there was a general sound of pages being turned, as if they were in class, and then they read a little bit of the Old Testament about making a well, very much as schoolboys translate an easy passage from the Anabasis when they have shut up their French grammar. Then they returned to the New Testament and the sad and beautiful figure of Christ. While Christ spoke, they made another effort to fit his interpretation of life upon the lives they lived. But as they were all very different, some practical, some ambitious, some stupid, some wild and experimental, some in love, and others long past any feeling except a feeling of comfort, they did very different things with the words of Christ. From their faces it seemed that, for the most part, they made no effort at all and recumbent, as it were, accepted the ideas the words gave as representing goodness in the same way, no doubt, as one of those industrious needlewomen had accepted the bright, ugly pattern on her mat as beauty. 
whatever the reason might be, for the first time in her life, instead of slipping at once into some curious pleasant cloud of emotion, too familiar to be considered. Rachel listened critically to what was being said. By the time they had swung in an irregular way from prayer to psalm, from psalm to history, from history to poetry, and Mr. Bax was giving out his text, she was in a state of acute discomfort. Such was the discomfort she felt when forced to sit through an unsatisfactory piece of music badly played. Tantalized, enraged by the clumsy insensitiveness of the conductor, who put the stress on the wrong places, and annoyed by the vast flock of the audience tamely praising and acquiescing without knowing or caring, so she was not tantalized and enraged. Only here, with eyes half shut and lips pursed together, the atmosphere of forced solemnity increased her anger. All round her were people pretending to feel what they did not feel, while somewhere above her floated the idea which they could none of them grasp, which they pretended to grasp, always escaping out of reach, a beautiful idea, an idea like a butterfly. One after another, vast and hard and cold, appeared to her the churches all over the world where this blundering effort and misunderstanding were perpetually going on. Great buildings filled with innumerable men and women, not seeing clearly, who finally gave up the effort to see, and relapsed tamely into praise and acquiescence, half shutting their eyes and pursing up their lips. The thought had the same sort of physical discomfort as is caused by a film of mist always coming between the eyes and the printed page. She did her best to brush away the film and to conceive something to be worshipped as the service went on, but failed always misled by the voice of Mr. Bax, saying things which misrepresented the idea, and by the patter of buying, inexpressive human voices, falling round her like damp leaves. The effort was tiring and dispiriting. She ceased to listen, and fixed her eyes on the face of a woman near her, a hospital nurse, whose expression of devout attention seemed to prove that she was at any rate receiving satisfaction. But looking at her carefully, she came to the conclusion that the hospital nurse was only slavishly acquiescent, and that the look of satisfaction was produced by no splendid conception of God within her. How, indeed, could she conceive anything far outside her own experience, a woman with a commonplace face like hers, a little round red face upon which trivial duties and trivial spites had drawn lines, whose weak blue eyes saw without intensity or individuality, whose features were blurred, insensitive, and callous. She was adoring something shallow and smug, clinging to it, so the obstinate mouth witnessed, with the assiduity of a limpet. Nothing would tear her from her demure belief in her own virtue and the virtues of her religion. She was a limpet, with the sensitive side of her stuck to a rock, forever dead to the rush of fresh and beautiful things past her. The face of this single worshipper became printed on Rachel's mind with an impression of keen horror, and she had it suddenly revealed to her what Helen meant and St. John meant when they proclaimed their hatred of Christianity. With the violence that now marked her feelings, she rejected all that she had implicitly believed. Meanwhile, Mr. Bax was halfway through the second lesson. 
She looked at him. He was a man of the world, with supple lips and an agreeable manner. He was indeed a man of much kindliness and simplicity, though by no means clever, but she was not in the mood to give any one credit for such qualities, and examined him as though he were an epitome of all the vices of his service. Right at the back of the chapel Mrs. Flushing, Hurst, and Hewitt sat in a row, in a very different frame of mind. Hewitt was staring at the roof with his legs stuck out in front of him, for as he had never tried to make the service fit any feeling or idea of his, he was able to enjoy the beauty of the language without hindrance. His mind was occupied first with accidental things, such as the women's hair in front of him, the light on the faces, then with the words which seemed to him magnificent, and then more vaguely with the characters of the other worshippers. But when he suddenly perceived Rachel, all these thoughts were driven out of his head, and he thought only of her. The psalms, the prayers, the litany, and the sermon were all reduced to one chanting sound which paused and then renewed itself a little higher or a little lower. He stared alternately at Rachel and at the ceiling, but his expression was now produced not by what he saw, but by something in his mind. He was almost as painfully disturbed by his thoughts as she was by hers. Early in the service Mrs. Flushing had discovered that she had taken up a Bible instead of a prayer book, and as she was sitting next to Hurst she stole a glance over his shoulder. He was reading steadily in the thin pale blue volume. Unable to understand, she peered closer, upon which Hurst politely laid the book before her, pointing to the first line of a Greek poem and then to the translation opposite. "'What's that?' she whispered inquisitively. "'Sappho,' he replied. "'The one Swinburne did. The best thing that's ever been written.'" End of chapter 17, part 1